Max Boot is going to tell us about these walls. He will make an opening presentation and we will then have a Q&A session. So please join me in uh, welcoming Max Boot. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Thank you to IPI for uh, hosting me. And thanks to all of you for turning out. I'm sure there are other things you could be doing on this frigid uh, February day, but I'm glad you're, you're keeping uh, warm here with us. And uh, I hope I will uh, reward your attendance with some new thoughts and, and new ideas and some new information about the subject of this book, which, as Francois says, is guerrilla warfare, and really guerrilla warfare and terrorism down through the ages. Now, I didn't write this book uh, to make any particular point. I really wrote it just to tell a story that I thought had never been well told before, a subject that I got interested in, as I think many people did, over the course of the last decade, and in my case, from having a chance to knock around a little bit in Iraq and Afghanistan and to see up close uh, the guerrilla wars that were being waged there, the terrorist campaigns and the counterinsurgency strategies being employed by American and allied troops. And I got interested in the subject and wanted to know more and wanted to figure out how unusual or not unusual what, we, what we've been seeing in the last decade has been. The answer is, uh, to get to the bottom line up front, is there is absolutely nothing new about low intensity conflict. You know, when I've been in writing this book, the question I most often get asked is, what was the first guerrilla war? And the answer is, it's impossible to say, uh, because guerrilla warfare has been around as long as mankind has been on this earth. Tribal war is essentially guerrilla war, because when you think about tribes, they don't have uh, rank structures, they don't have logistic services, uh, they don't have uniforms, and they don't engage in the kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe frontal infantry battle that uh, has been uh, seen as the epitome of, of combat ever since the days of the Greek hoplites. Tribes engage essentially in, primarily in, hit and run, uh, uh, ambush and surprise uh, type tactics. Uh, they will raid an enemy village and retreat before the, uh, the warriors belonging to the enemy tribe uh, uh, can appear uh, to inflict punishment upon them. That is the essence both of ancient uh, tribal warfare as well as of modern guerrilla warfare. All guerrillas strive to avoid the full firepower and the full might of a more powerful adversary, and they use surprise, ambush, and stealth in order to inflict damage and to wear down their adversary, even if they are not able to prevail on a conventional battlefield. Now, by <clears throat> stressing the ancient origins of guerrilla warfare, I don't mean to suggest that absolutely nothing has changed over the centuries. Obviously, there have been some big changes, uh, a notable change, of course, being the, the increase in lethality of armaments available to insurgents. But to my mind, the biggest change of all is the rising power of the three Ps, politics, propaganda, and public opinion. And all of these factors in, in guerrilla warfare, uh, I think, really came together for one of the very first times in our very own War of Independence. You know, as I remember being taught uh, about the American uh, rebellion from Britain uh, in school, back in the days when it was still taught in school, uh, the, the narrative often culminated in the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, when Lord Cornwallis surrendered 7,000 British troops uh, to uh, General Washington. That's often seen as being the final American victory in the War of Independence. But in fact, Britain was far from defeated at that point. Uh, the British still had tens of thousands of troops in North America, uh, and tens of thousands more in other parts of the empire, and tens of thousands more they could have hired from the German states if they had been so inclined. If uh, George Washington and the Founding Fathers had been fighting not the British Empire, but the Roman Empire, I can guarantee you that it would not have had a happy ending. They would have wound up being crucified, quite literally, because the Romans uh, did not stand still for defeats on the battlefield. Uh, 
But that did not happen in the case of the British Empire because of a vote that occurred in the House of Commons in 1782 when there was actually a very close division on the question of whether to discontinue offensive operations in North America. The House voted by a very narrow margin to end the war, which led to the downfall of Lord North, the Tory Prime Minister who had been bent on, on fighting as hard as possible, and the rise of Lord Rockingham and his Whigs, who were committed to a policy of conciliation with their American brethren. Now this is pretty significant, because here was this great power, the superpower of its day, which had not truly been defeated on the battlefield, but nevertheless decided to stop fighting because public opinion had turned against the war. That is an indication of what has changed in low intensity conflict over the last couple of centuries. And it's a trend that's accelerated in the last 50 or 60 years with the growth and the rise of the mass media. Uh, television, the internet, satellites, all of these instruments which allow even a relatively unsophisticated adversary to bring down a far more powerful foe. And while this was a tactic that was employed very successfully by the United States or by, by the nascent states that would become the United States against the British Empire in the 18th century, it has also been employed against us many times in the past in places like Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. This has been a pretty successful formula for fighting a, a, a nation as, as powerful militarily as the United States. Now that isn't to imply that it's impossible to defeat insurgents even in this media age. I think it is possible. We've seen indications of how that can be done in places like Colombia, Northern Ireland, and Iraq in 2007-2008 all of which have seen the implementation of counterinsurgency strategies very similar to those that have been employed throughout history in places like Malaya and the Philippines to prevail against even very deep-seated insurgencies. And it basically comes down to two things. First, you have to have security. And second, you have to have legitimacy. By security, I mean securing the population. It doesn't mean chasing a bunch of insurgents around the wilderness and, and never catching them. That was the mistake that we made in, for many years in Vietnam. You have to be able to secure the population in the way that US forces did in Iraq, for example, in 2007, by pushing off their giant forward operating bases and moving into the neighborhoods where the people actually lived. But in addition to security, you also have to have legitimacy, because very few counterinsurgents have ever won with, by offering nothing but death and desolation. Even the Romans, the Romans get kind of a bum rap uh, because when we think of Roman counterinsurgency, we think of that famous quote about they create a desert and call it peace. But in fact, there was a lot more to Roman counterinsurgency than that. The Romans offered, in addition to harsh retribution for rebellion, they offered incentives for those who accepted Roman rule, bread and circuses, peace and security, the Pax Romana, there were reasons why the Roman Empire lasted as long as it did, and it wouldn't have done as well as it did if it had not offered nothing but, uh, but the promise of, of death to its inhabitants. And that's, you know, every successful counterinsurgent ever since then has had to offer something positive, uh, usually some degree of self-determination and, and addressing the basic political and social needs of the people. That's a formula that uh, is the best way, that combination of security and legitimacy, that's the best way to address uh, any insurgency. But even if you're doing everything absolutely right, even if you have enough security personnel, even if you have legitimacy, even if you offer the people something to fight for, even then, there are not going to be any quick or easy victories over any deep-rooted insurgency. Uh, according to the work that I've done for this book, the average insurgency since 1945 has lasted 10 years. So that's something you have to accept. This is not going to be quick or easy. It's painstaking, long-term, and laborious, but it is possible to defeat insurgents. And this is something we'd better think hard, long and hard about because as Francois said, insurgency is not going away. It is, has always been the dominant form of warfare. It remains so today. The last conventional war the world has seen occurred in 2008 during the Russian invasion of Georgia. But thousands of people are dying all over the world in irregular conflicts. So we better figure out what these wars are all about because they remain as dominant now as they have ever been.
Thank you, Max. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on this? What is what are the main takeaway from those uh, uh, the history of these wars and and your analysis of the current conflicts and and. What's interesting in, in, in your book is that you combine your historical research and also the field observations you made. You visited, I think, a dozen times Iraq and Afghanistan. You've been to Colombia, to the Philippines. You've been to war zones in Lebanon and Israel. And you kind of merge those two uh, uh, work streams that you have into a set of lessons, or you call them implications, or the, uh, the, the rules. I don't remember exactly how the thing is entitled, but the, could you please give us a bit more on, 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 on those implications? Sure. Well, there's, there's a bunch of, uh, of different lessons you can learn from this history. I mean, one of them that jumps out at you is it's much easier uh, to overthrow a government than to secure a government. <laughs> and we've seen, you know, from the American perspective, we've certainly been on both sides of it because, for example, in Afghanistan, in the 1980s, we helped the Mujahideen to overthrow uh, Soviet rule. More recently, in the fall of 2001, we helped the Northern Alliance to overthrow the Taliban. Uh, and we've helped rebels in Libya and other countries overthrow their despotic regimes. It's not that hard to do, especially when you can bring the outside resources of a country like the United States to bear. It's much harder to stabilize and secure a government, and that's really been I would say our biggest challenge, uh, certainly in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya, it will be a huge challenge in Syria if and when the Assad regime is, is finally deposed. It's very hard to bring order out of chaos. And what we often find is that uh, guerrilla wars break down the very fabric of society. Uh, in, for example, Spain, uh, where the very word guerrilla was coined, meaning literally small war, in the Spanish resistance against Napoleon from 1808 to 1814, the fighting did not end once the French troops left. Spain was racked by a century of uprisings and insurgencies culminating, of course, in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. And that's a sign of, of how deep-rooted these conflicts can become and how hard it is to establish order out of this kind of war. Uh, it's possible to do, but it requires a, a massive long-term commitment. And one of the you know, big challenges we face around the world is trying, because you can't just defeat an insurgency through purely military means. Uh, any kind of low-intensity conflict is really a competition of governance to see who can offer uh, better governance to the population. And so the challenge, I think, that we face in all sorts of states, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Algeria, uh, all these other places, Libya, is who can provide better governance, whether it's going to be uh, violent extremists or whether it's going to be more responsible, moderate governments. That's, that's I think, in, in many ways, the biggest issue affecting the, the security of the world right now. And, you know, unfortunately, from the American perspective, we're a lot better at doing things like targeted killing of insurgents than we are in bringing stability and security uh, to, to life in these very chaotic and, and violent lands. And that's, to my mind, that's, that's a huge challenge that we will continue to grapple with. Thank you. The, before I open the um, for questions to, uh, from our participant, perhaps one more uh, question linked to the, uh, to the book is, you have a fantastic cast of characters in the book. You have people who are extremely known, uh, Mao, uh, Lawrence, um, uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud. Uh, you have people who are less known, at least less known today, uh, but were famous in their times, uh, Toussaint Louverture, Edward Lansdale, or David Galula. And if you have, among, in, in all this you know, cast of people, if you could pick up you know, two of them, one who would be the kind of the, the, the guerrilla leader par, ex, par excellence, and another one who would be the counterinsurgent or the, the counter strategist by, by excellence. Who, who would be those two, those two characters? Well, I'm happy to talk about uh, these characters endlessly because they're really what drove me in the process of writing this book over six years. Uh, there were some fascinating personalities, and if I, 
you know, just I could pick many, but I'll mention one insurgent and one counterinsurgent. And for among insurgents, I will say that one of my favorite terrorists from this book, uh, one of the few that I'd want to sit down and have a beer with, is uh, Michael Collins, who was the great strategist of the Irish struggle for independence in uh, the late teens and early 1920s. Uh, he was this uh, fiery uh, personality who would uh, uh, bike around Dublin uh, in plain sight and escaped from British security forces on numerous occasions, sometimes clambering out of the back window as they were breaking into the front door of wherever he happened to be. And he was somebody who did not hesitate to order the assassination of British intelligence operatives and detectives. But at the same time, he was a, a fun-loving guy who liked to, uh, uh, to have a, a beer with the lads. He had an eye for the lasses. And uh, most importantly of all, I would say, he had a sense of moderation, which is often lacking among terrorist leaders. But he knew when to accept a settlement, even if it was not everything that he would have hoped for. And he ultimately did help to end uh, the Irish War of Independence with a settlement that he negotiated with Winston Churchill, which left Northern Ireland still under British control. And a lot of his former comrades in the IRA were not happy with that. They therefore uh, waged a, a civil war against Michael Collins and the government of Ireland, which in fact cost Michael Collins his life. He was killed by his former comrades during the course of that war. But the settlement that he had fought for was overwhelmingly ratified by the people of Ireland, and it still exists to this day. So he was somebody who I think had a sense of humanity, which is rare among those who can be classified as terrorist leaders. And among counterinsurgents, I would cite to you one of my favorite characters who has now been unfairly forgotten, uh, Edward Lansdale, once famous as the Quiet American, although there's actually some debate as to whether or not he was in fact the basis uh, for that character in Graham Greene's novel, The Quiet American. He was a former advertising man uh, who enlisted in the Air Force and the CIA and was sent to the Philippines in the late 1940s to help them defeat this Huck Rebellion, one of many communist and nationalist uprisings during that period. And he succeeded brilliantly in large part by uh, befriending uh, Ramon Mike Saise, who was the then just a state senator, but who Lansdale helped to become defense minister and then president, who was a honest, hardworking, one of the great leaders, I would say, of the last 50 or 60 years, and who curbed corruption by the armed forces, uh, abuse by the, by the government, won the trust of the people, and ultimately uh, made it impossible for the Hucks to win any popular support. And then Lansdale moved on from there to South Vietnam, uh, where he arrived not long after Dien Bien Phu, when the state of South Vietnam was just being established. And he quickly befriended uh, Diem and helped him to create the state of South Vietnam and, in fact, moderated some of Diem's wilder impulses, which were given free reign after Lansdale left Vietnam. And then he returned to Vietnam in the mid-1960s when the American War was well underway. And he was appalled by what he found because he did not believe this massive expenditure of firepower could possibly defeat the Viet Cong. He argued for a, a more population-centric, gentler approach to counterinsurgency, which relied on building up the legitimacy and popularity of the South Vietnamese government. But he was not listened to, and so he ended his days as a prophet in the wilderness. But I think it's well worthwhile today revisiting Lansdale's teachings because I still think that they have a great deal of application to the problems we face around the world. Thank you, Max. It's interesting to, to see that one of the greatest counterinsurgents of all times was coming from the adver advertising uh, industry. And yes. I think you, you explain in your book that he helped promote to the, the East Coast uh, uh, a garment maker from, the, uh, from San Francisco, which was called uh, Levi. And uh, everybody knows that it was a successful story. The, I'd like to open the floor to, to questions. The, um, the book has a, a very wide scope. We have, I think, more than 40 minutes in front of us, so please don't hesitate to come up with your, uh, your questions. Uh, wave your hands to get the microphone, speak in the microphone, and please introduce yourself when you, when you ask the question. Uh, Mary, please. 
Hi, Marie O'Reilly from IPI. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm curious, as you were working on the book, you know, just a moment ago, you mentioned Michael Collins, for example, as a figure who showed some moderation, um, sometimes didn't, but knew when to settle and had a set of demands and accepted a settlement. And I'm curious, did you have any difficulty distinguishing or rather not distinguishing between insurgents, terrorists, guerrillas. It's obviously a very wide sweeping book. Is there a necessity for some distinction there? Well, that's a good question. And the answer is it's very hard to have uh, very rigid or firm definitions of all of these terms. As the saying has it, one man's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And there is a lot of elasticity in the way these terms are used because, of course, every counterinsurgent always tries to brand their enemies as terrorists. In fact, this, in, in Malaya in the 1950s, when the British were fighting the Malayan Races Liberation Army, which was this classic Marxist slash nationalist insurgent group, their official designation in British literature was Communist Terrorists, capital C, capital T. Uh, so, even though, you know, I would argue that by an objective standard, they were really facing a guerrilla movement, which is a designation that for some reason we never want to bestow on any of our enemies because the word guerrilla for some reason has laudatory connotations, whereas terrorist does not. I mean, there actually have been a few terrorists who didn't mind being called terrorists. For example, the Russian nihilists in the, in the 19th century, but it's very rare that anybody will, will voluntarily adopt that moniker today, and so we try to apply it to people willy-nilly. I mean, what I, you know, you can debate endlessly about what all of these terms mean. Basically, my, the foundation of my work, or the way I decided to, to define things, is there's basically a spectrum of conflict, and uh, terrorists are at the bottom. They're so weak, usually small groups of no more than a few dozen or a few hundred individuals uh, who have no hope of engaging any kind of uh, security force and open battle and have to rely primarily upon attacks on the civilian population. So then you start off at the bottom with terrorists. Then you have guerrillas who can often be larger, thousands or even tens and hundreds of thousands of people who can often hope to liberate, quote unquote, certain areas of the country, which become essentially territory that they administer. Uh, so you have terrorists, guerrillas, and then you have conventional forces, which are obviously uniform, uniform military forces answering to an established government. And then finally, at the very highest spectrum of conflict, you have weapons of mass destruction, which thankfully have not been used too often. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know if that clarifies the matter or not, but you can, if you read the literature, you'll see entire books written debating about what these terms mean. And I decided not to waste too much time or energy thinking about definitions. And I, what I did was I actually wrote about both terrorists and guerrillas because I found it very hard to disaggregate the two because what I found is that most or, or many groups engage in both terrorist and guerrilla tactics. And so it's not one or the other. It's a, it's a spectrum of conflict. Warren Hogue of IPI. Max, I wonder if um, insurgencies bear the same burden of establishing security and legitimacy that, that the great powers do when they go in to try to put an end to insurgency. And I have in mind some recent events. One that happened last two weeks ago, where the liberation of Timbuktu, you suddenly had people dancing in the streets. Obviously, the insurgents, the jihadists there, had not been very popular when they'd been there. They had not established security or legitimacy. I'm thinking also of areas that are liberated from the Taliban. You get a similar kind of outpouring. So I wondered if, uh, if the formula works for the other side. Do they, to, in order to be successful, do they have to establish popularity, legitimacy, security? Absolutely. Uh, that's a good question. And the answer is definitely yes, that, you know, this kind of war is really a, as I said before, a battle of governance. And it's not just the security forces or the government that have to provide governance that the people will accept. So too do the insurgents. I mean, this was something that Mao, for example, was keenly aware of because he counseled uh, his forces to behave well with the villagers to not to steal from them, to put their latrines a safe distance from people's water sources, to treat the people with respect, because Mao understood 
You had to win over the peasants in order to establish the base areas from which he could collect uh, intelligence, taxes, recruits, everything he needed to build up uh, the Red Army. Uh, and if you don't do that, if you don't establish good relations with the people, uh, it can be very easy to, to route a, an insurgent force. And we've seen, as you mentioned, an excellent example of that with the jihadists in, in northern Mali, where they were not popular, they were not well received. They held sway at gunpoint, but as soon as somebody uh, with more guns came along, in this case the French army, the people were very happy to welcome them. The same thing happened, of course, with the Taliban, who misruled Afghanistan and therefore made it very easy for us to uh, oust them from power in the fall of 2001 with the support of the Northern Alliance. The same thing happened, I might add, with al-Qaeda in Iraq. I mean, this was a lot of the reason why the surge in Iraq was successful was because the extremists of al-Qaeda in Iraq, who were often not Iraqi, the leadership coming from other countries by and large, abused the Sunni population of Anbar province. They offended the tribes. They married their daughters. They stole their smuggling businesses. They told them they couldn't smoke and drink, which are things that you know, people in Anbar province, like all over the world, like to do. And so they alienated, they alienated their base of support among the Sunnis, which is what made possible the, the, Sunni, the Anbar awakening in, in 2006, 2007, when all of a sudden all of the tribes in Anbar province flipped from being allied with, with al-Qaeda uh, to being opposed to it. Because al-Qaeda in Iraq, just like uh, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, just like the Taliban, had not, during the time when they were actually governing some territory, had not established their popularity and legitimacy, and that contributed to their ultimate downfall. So there is no question that these groups have to do a good job, and that's why, for example, you'll see organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas paying so much attention to running social welfare programs. Uh, it's not because, you know, they're simple-minded idealists or humanitarians is because they understand this is the basis of their power. They have to offer some benefits to the people in order to convince the people to host their fighters in their midst, and they do. There's also, I mean, there's obviously a stick involved because uh, these organizations deal ruthlessly with so-called traitors, anybody who openly opposes them, but they understand that the great mass of people are usually sitting on the fence and they need to be offered some benefits in order to acquiesce to your rule, which is why you know, Hezbollah, for example, spends so much money, uh, so much Iranian money, to try to uh, uh, cement its power in Lebanon. That's, that's been a key for both sides in this kind of struggle. Thank you, Max. I, I think I saw hands in, the, in this area. No, there were people. Well, then, then let's go. <laughs> let's go to the left. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was an excellent, insightful presentation. Uh, I'm Roger Barrett from the uh, Permanent Mission of Canada. I'd like to drill down a little bit on the uh, aspect of legitimacy. Uh, drill down a little bit on the aspect of legitimacy um, from a framework of, of Afghanistan. Uh, I commanded a battle group for eight months in Afghanistan, fighting alongside my American brothers, and the complexity was incredible in the terms of um, altruistic actions don't necessarily equal legitimacy based on cultural milieu that we were in. And it was almost as a Samuel Huntington-ish class of civilizations where we are legitimate in, in our eyes, but perhaps not uh, looking through the view of someone else's lens. Uh, a very complex situation. If you could please uh, address that. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, first, thanks for your service in a, in a very valuable and, and difficult cause. Uh, and I think you're right that it's not easy to establish legitimacy. It takes a lot more, for example, than just simply holding an election and saying, oh, we're supporting a democratic elected government, therefore, by definition, we're legitimate. That may work to establish your legitimacy across the street here. It doesn't necessarily establish your legitimacy in villages in Kandahar or Helmand province. I think people tend to judge based on actions, not on, not on promises. And the, and the challenge is to try to extend uh, security and response of government. And of course, what people are, are, are looking for can often vary dramatically from place to place. And you know, counterinsurgency, one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because it's so context specific. There is not a cookie cutter approach you can apply everywhere. Uh, there's some general principles, but in terms of how you actually apply them, it has to be very context specific and really rooted 
and an understanding of that region and its people, which is impossible to acquire from afar. It really can only be gained by experience. I would say that in, from the American standpoint, one of the big mistakes that we've made in Iraq and Afghanistan is thinking that we could establish legitimacy by shoveling vast amounts of money into those countries, spending literally tens of billions of dollars on various uh, public works projects, electrification plants, clean water plants, hospitals, schools, all these wonderful things that intuitively we feel that people should welcome. It hasn't always worked out. It often has not worked out, in fact, because, you know, people may be happy to have schools or electricity plants in their midst or what have you, but they're still not going to support you if they're going to get killed for doing so. Uh, it, fundamentally, you, you first of all have to have security. Uh, whether, you know, as John Paul Vance said in Vietnam, whether it's 98% or 15% or, or whatever percent of the, of the problem it is, it's the first 98% or it's the first 15% because only when you have a, a baseline of security will everything else that you do in terms of social and political needs have any traction. And of course, one of the problems we had in, in Iraq and Afghanistan in the, in the early years is we didn't do enough to establish security. We sent very few of our own troops, and we did very little to train indigenous security forces. And so you had this lawless climate where you were make, spending vast amounts of money on public works projects. And as often as not, what they were actually doing was fueling this runaway corruption, which was making the situation in many ways worse rather than better. And one of the unfortunate consequences of all of our spending especially in Afghanistan, has been it's empowered this group of kleptocrats who are uh, deeply enmeshed into the, into the workings of the government of Afghanistan and prey upon the people who make use of our resources uh, to increase their power and, and their ability to abuse the people and thereby inadvertently drive the people into the arms of, of the Taliban. And we've, you know, we've made the situation worse in many places by not understanding the human terrain on which we were fighting. And we would, in, we would you know, often troops would come in and, and, and see somebody that they thought was the local power broker and, and shovel money and support his way only to learn that this guy actually represents one clan or one tribe or one faction. And by empowering him, you're alienating and, and angering the rest of the population who then turn to the enemy in order to fight against what they see as their disempowerment. So this is incredibly complex. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm just happy that all I have to do is write about this stuff, that I don't actually have to practice it. Because if you have to practice it, you have to be so alive to these cultural nuances and, and, and be aware of who you're empowering and what the consequences of your actions are. And too often, uh, you know, we have not done that. And in fact, the very way that we rotate our forces with everybody you know, spending no more than uh, six months to a year in country makes it very hard to gain that kind of understanding and, and, and to really figure out how to use your power wisely. The, uh, you, you're talking about practice, um, you mentioned the uh, financial resources. There's also the question of the military resources to uh, the, the, the necessary deployment to ensure security. and. Uh, here and there, and also in your book, there is this notion of a ratio between the number of counterinsurgents and civilians. Does such a ratio still make sense? Uh, what is the ratio? Uh, where, where does it come from? Is it, is it something which was true in the 50s, 60s, less true now? What, what is your take on that? Well, there has been a lot of talk about uh, the proper ratio of security forces to population. And as a general rule of thumb, for example, in the, in the counterinsurgency field manual, which was issued by the US Army and Marine Corps in late 2006, I think the ratio works out to about one counterinsurgent per 50 population. But you know, there's no, I don't think there's any hard or fast numbers about this, uh, because this, this tends to be rather elastic in terms of how you calculate it. Because you know, in a country like Afghanistan, how do you calculate the proper ratio when the insurgency is confined to about, 40% uh, of the population, maybe 45%, basically the Pashtuns are the only part of the country that is really sympathetic to the Taliban. So do you need the same proportion of, of, of forces, security forces, the population in the non-Pashtun areas as you need in the Pashtun areas? You know, probably not. So that reduces your overall requirements. But fundamentally, I think, uh, and of course, you know, the ratio can also change depending on if you start to have a little bit of success. Most people in a, uh, 
who are uh, facing an, an insurgency in their midst, most people tend to be fence sitters for obvious reasons of, of self-protection because they want to see who's going to be the more powerful side before they choose sides. But if one side emerges as clearly dominant, all of a sudden the ratio can snowball because all of a sudden more people are joining your side. And that's what happened in Iraq uh, because of the initial success of the surge in 2007. More Sunnis were starting to sign up. And all of a sudden the, the ratio was tilting very heavily against the insurgents. So, you know, it's hard to it's hard to draw any hard and you know, hard and fast rules that rigid rules that you have to follow, but I think the general rule of thumb is you do have to have a, a certain uh, critical mass of security forces to safeguard uh, the population, and they have to be present among the population 24/7. The one thing that really does not work in this kind of warfare is commuting to work. Uh, is uh, being uh, based on some isolated forward operating base far from the population and then showing up once a day in a big convoy of armored vehicles co going into a village and saying, hey, you guys seen any Taliban? You guys seen any Al-Qaeda around here? Would you mind telling us who they are? Well, you'd have to be a pretty dense villager to actually rat out some insurgent uh, because you know the Americans are going to leave in 20 minutes and the insurgents will be back to cut your throat. So if you're going to try to generate any useful intelligence out of that population, you'd better be willing to stick around during the nighttime and protect them from the inevitable retaliation. Thank you, Max. I think we have a question, uh, Howard Stoffer. And then in the front, maybe we can take the two questions. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm Howard Stouffer, uh, previously with the UN Counterterrorism Office and uh, now with the University of New Haven. Um, I was interested in asking, and as a follow-up to Francois's question, um, you know, the Lansdale paradigm that you want to win over the population and the British formula in uh, the melee con conflict against insurgents, 10 to 1, 10 troops for every insurgent you think is out there. Um, in light of the debate that's literally going on in the U.S. Congress now, as, as John Brennan, the counterterrorism chief, uh, testifies for, to become director of CIA, the debate that's been going on this m is basically over whether drones have actually alienated more of the population as you take out specific targets, or as he is asserting, that it actually frees up population to uh, feel free to be able to uh, work with the government or with the uh, forces that are in the area freeing you from the insurgents. Thank you. Well, I think uh, as a general rule of thumb, I would say drones can be a useful tool, one of many in this kind of warfare, but they are not the end all and be all. They are not some magic button that you can push and blow up somebody half a world away and imagine that you're dealing effectively with this insurgency that you face. Uh, I mean, drone strikes are really only the latest version of a decapitation strategy aimed at eliminating the insurgent leadership. And, you know, decapitation strategies have a mixed, a mixed track record. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Very often what happens is if you don't actually control the territory on which the insurgent group operates, they can regenerate themselves. And these uh, decapitation strikes are about as effective as mowing the lawn. It doesn't produce long-term consequences. Uh, Israel, for example, has seen that with their attempts to eliminate the leadership of Hamas and Hezbollah. It hasn't seriously dented the long-term prospects of those organizations. Or in Iraq in 2006, when the Joint Special Operations Command uh, managed to track down and kill Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, that was a very successful mission. Nevertheless, the situation in Iraq continued to deteriorate until you implemented the surge and this clear and hold population-centric approach, which was much more comprehensive than simply trying to eliminate a few leaders in the enemy organization. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not opposed to these drone strikes because I think we have very few other options in countries like Pakistan, Yemen, or Somalia where we're not going to send a lot of ground troops, and we can't rely upon the host nation forces to really gain control of their own territory anytime soon. So I think on the whole, we don't really have any choice but to continue these, these drone strikes because they may be a Band-Aid, but they're the only one that we have. And there is some risk, obviously, that we run that if they are not discriminant enough, that if they create a lot of civilian damage, uh, that they may actually uh, create more enemies than they eliminate. It's very hard to assess the effectiveness of those strikes because uh, 
even U.S. intelligence agencies, I don't think, have a lot of ability to go into these areas where they where they strike and really get an on-the-ground sense. So a lot of this is just speculation. But certainly, I think there are some valid arguments that uh, the strikes, in some cases, will alienate the population. In other cases, they'll welcome the strikes because the locals feel uh, oppressed by these terrorist leaders in their midst, much as we saw in the case of Mali or other countries. So I think it's hard to gauge the long-term uh, impact on public opinion, but I, if I were President Obama, I certainly would not discontinue those strikes because there's not a lot else, not a lot else we can do uh, to keep these uh, terrorist groups off balance. Thank you. We have a question in the front. Uh, Lucy Webster, how would you uh, describe the situation in Syria in relation to the different categories and? trends that you have identified over the centuries? <laughs> well, Syria is in the midst of a, uh, of a very bloody uh, insurgency right now, probably the bloodiest one going on anywhere in the world, uh, with obviously something like more than 60,000 people having been killed in the last couple of years. Uh, it's at the moment, I would say, uh, the war is, is at more or less a stalemate a lot of which has to do with the quest for legitimacy, uh, which, which was alluded to earlier, which is a challenge for both sides. And both sides uh, have not done a tremendous job of establishing their, their legitimacy, uh, but they benefit in, in some ways from the mistakes of the other side. I mean, Assad has obviously lost the support of most of the Sunni population. Uh, however, the, the insurgents, have not been able to win over uh, some of the business and other elites, and they have not been able to win over uh, the Alawites, uh, the Kurds, the Christians, some of the other minorities in Syria who fear the consequences of, of Sunni domination. And certainly by some of their actions, some of the massacres and that have been carried out by the insurgents, uh, by the growing predominance of of Islamist extremists among their ranks, they, they make it much harder to win over the population. But Assad, you know, he hasn't done anything to establish his legitimacy with most of the country either. He's, you know, raining death and destruction down upon his own citizenry. He, he doesn't offer any positive alternative either. And so right now, they're at a bit of a stalemate, in part because both sides also receive outside support, which is one of the most crucial determinants of success or failure in this kind of conflict. Assad is getting a lot of support from Iran. Uh, the rebels are getting support from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and other uh, Gulf states. Uh, at the moment, I think those, those two sides are basically balancing each other out. I think it would be quite possible uh, for the United States and our NATO allies to come in and tilt the balance decisively against Assad by supplying weaponry to the insurgents and perhaps by declaring a no-fly zone or undertaking airstrikes on government positions as we did in the case of Libya. And I think there was a strong case to be made for doing that, certainly in the early years of the conflict, because I think if we'd done that, we could have been able to short-circuit the conflict and to keep the fighting from raging out of control as long as it has. But right now, it's, it's, it's just a very depressing, gruesome situation where it's hard to know how any of this will end, because what I see is, and you know, I'm an observer from afar, and I'm sure others have a better sense of it from the region, but just from what I see from afar is this kind of atomization of society which occurs in the throes of one of these conflicts where there's a complete breakdown of law and order, and people tend to gravitate to the strongmen in their midst, to the extremists, who they think will protect their sect, clan, family, what have you. And it's very, very hard to assemble a working polity after something like that has happened. Uh, it often takes outside intervention, as in the case of Bosnia or Kosovo, but I think there's very little chance of, you know, uh, United Nations or other peacekeepers going in on the ground in, in Syria any time in the foreseeable future. So I think there's a real chance that this fighting could, uh, could last for years, as in the case of Lebanon, with just this long-running war that will take an ever-growing toll. Uh, could you perhaps follow up on, on the, this issue of, of the... Uh uh, the humanitarian toll, the uh, uh, guerrilla wars, I mean, and conventional wars are not better in this regard, but they uh, have a tremendous hum uh, humanitarian tolls. I think that you, you give the statistics of uh, 
uh, guerrilla in uh, Yugoslavia at the time of World War II, and the country lost, uh, I think, something like around 10% of its population uh, between the uh, guerrilla operations, the uh, retaliation by the uh, uh, occupying forces. The uh, How come public opinion, which plays a role in in the outside, never or seldom plays a role inside, in the country, which is uh, impacted by a conflict. The, uh, uh, do you have a moment where, or maybe you have examples, where uh, public opinion start to say, no, it's enough, uh, enough fighting, uh, too many dead? Well, that's a good question. Um, I would say it's very hard uh, for uh, people who want uh, peace and quiet to make their voice felt amid the devastation of war. And as I said you know, a minute ago, what happens in these conflicts often is you see this atomization of society, this breakdown, and people driven to extremes, which I think is basically what happened in the former Yugoslavia. It happened in Iraq in the last decade, uh, where there's a, you know, people, in the case of Iraq, for example, I mean, you had Sunni and Shia living relatively peacefully, side by side in many areas, just as in the former Yugoslavia, you had Bosnians and Croatians and, and Serbs and others living fairly peaceably side by side. And it wasn't like these people were necessarily seething with hatred for one another. There was a lot of intermarriage. There was a lot of peaceful relations. But when you have this you know, breakdown of law and order, the only way people can get any security, because there's no longer a legitimate uh, army or, or police force to protect them. The only way they can get any kind of security is from some kind of militia, which represents an extremist faction, maybe a, a tribal or, or a clan faction, uh, and may stand for very radical things that people don't necessarily believe. But as the war goes on, they tend to believe the propaganda. And as, as, the, as, the, as the death toll mounts, feelings on, on all sides uh, turn hard. And people who might have, you know, lived peacefully next to their neighbors one day are, are slitting their throats the next day. Uh, that tends to be true of many wars, even conventional wars, where it, they may start off in, for relatively limited objectives and wind up becoming a struggle to the death uh, because of, of the feelings that, that arise in the course of the conflict. But it's especially true, I would say, in these kinds of wars, which are fought among the people and not by professional military forces. Uh, so. You know, there, I'm sure there are a lot of people in, in Syria today, for example, uh, perhaps the great majority, who wish that the fighting would simply end, but they have no way of enforcing that idea upon the armed militias, because the only way you're going to end the rule of militias is by having some stronger security force. And if you don't, it, uh, you know, they will disregard uh, the desire for peace that, that many people may feel. You certainly see that, for example, in the case of Libya, where I suspect most Libyans are very unhappy to be at the mercy of these militias, but they don't have a, a, a strong national army or police force, and so there's, mm -hmm. there's little they can do about it. Thank you. Yeah. Ambassador Mungaro? I think you had uh, Max, uh, I thank you for very much. Uh, I'm Alfred from Gabon, and um, uh, I think when we were on the Security Council, now I found myself who went to Afghanistan on with the Security Council mission. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, some allied troops are pulling out. What kind of assessment uh, in terms of security, of uh, reducing the capacity of nuisance of insurgency can you make? Thank you. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried about the long-term future of Afghanistan. What I've seen in the last few years is some real progress on the ground, and I've, I've had the opportunity to travel around in Helmand and Kandahar provinces and see the way that U.S. and Canadian, British, Afghan, and other forces have driven the Taliban out of many of their one-time strongholds. But that same kind of clear and hold strategy has not been carried out in eastern Afghanistan, where you still have Haqqani sanctuaries located an hour's drive from Kabul. And although I think the Taliban have suffered real setbacks, they also have tremendous resiliency because they continue to enjoy safe havens in Pakistan, which I would stress is one of the key factors enabling the success of many other insurgencies over the centuries. Uh, one of the other hopeful trends is that the Afghan National Security Forces have been growing in size and competence. There are about 
350,000 strong now, and they're pretty good at, at light infantry operations. They're on the front lines. They're suffering more casualties than coalition forces. They are taking the fight to the Taliban, but they still have major deficiencies in, in key enablers that, that the American forces currently provide for them, in intelligence, logistics, medevac, air support, a lot of these other factors that they need to keep fighting as effectively as they do. And to keep providing that kind of support in the future will require, I believe, a substantial advise and assist force even after 2014. I think it's possible to ramp down, certainly from where we are today with 66,000 U.S. troops in, in Afghanistan, but you can't go down to zero. The recommendation of General John Allen, who's, who's leaving Sunday as our commander and as the NATO commander there, uh, is that he would, he would like to see about 20,000 U.S. troops remain after 2014 to assist the, the Afghan forces. Now, my read on the politics in Washington is there's basically not a snowball's chance in hell that we're going to keep 20,000 troops there after 2014. In fact, some of the leaks emanating out of the White House suggest that there is serious consideration being given to the zero option, or if not zero, maybe just a few thousand troops. And my concern is that may not be sufficient to bolster the Afghan security forces. And so if we don't provide enough support for them, the risk is that the same thing will happen as occurred in the early 1990s when the Soviets cut off aid for Najibullah. He was rapidly overthrown and the country was seized by all-out civil war, which created the conditions which led to the rise of the Taliban. And we've seen this movie before. We know how it turns out. It doesn't have a happy ending. I would hope that we would learn from the lessons of history and avoid repeating those mistakes again, but I fear that we may not. Marvin, we have a question here and then another one. Maybe we can take two questions. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Vlad Lupan, ambassador of Moldova. Um, I'm very glad that you have mentioned from the very beginning the three Ps. Uh, the uh, politics, the propaganda, and the public opinion. Uh, propaganda. Um, one, one specifying question. Uh, did you include the uh, tradition of transmitting the information throughout the uh, insurgents by the by way of words uh, rather than, uh, and the tradition to transmit the history uh, 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 and to create a new history uh, through that. Uh, second, uh, speaking about the um, uh, giving a certain um, priority to uh, picking up candidates for support. Um, yeah, but you know, there is a dilemma here, and uh, you've already practically answered the question, but um, you know, if you don't pick from this clan, you will have to pick from the other. And I'm saying that from experience in the field. So the dilemma is there, but you need to solve it. And trying to find a common candidate uh, uh, that would be acceptable for both sides is quite difficult and remains one of the ma major difficulties in, in terms of implementation when you go. And the third uh, uh, point is you have spoken about the uh, counterinsurgency from obviously from US perspective. Uh, my take is that the insurgents are quite well cooperating between themselves, or at least they have some sort of a link or the possibility to, to learn faster. Uh, what about the cooperative effort between the counter insurgents? Thank you. Maybe we'll take, this is a fairly uh, complex question, so maybe we'll take it okay. on its own and then we go yeah. back to the other participant. Well, those are excellent comments and questions. Let me take the last one first. And you're right about uh, how insurgents learn from one another, which is, by the way, a new development in history. Because when you think about in the 19th century, this was not something that Western armies had to worry about. Uh, for example, you had in Southern Africa the Zulus resisting the British army. On the plains of North America, you had the Sioux resisting the American army. I can assure you that the Sioux and the Zulus did not compare notes to figure out the best way to fight a modern Western army. They had no idea of each other's existence, whereas the counterinsurgents did compare notes, and they published books like Colonel Charles Caldwell's Small Wars, which was a British army manual on small wars, which was widely read in, in many militaries around the world. And so this was, 
in, 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 in times prior to the 20th century, the information advantage really lay with the counterinsurgents. That's not true anymore. And in fact, you know, one of the great innovations of modern insurgency, really driven by Osama bin Laden and, and al-Qaeda, is the internationalization of insurgency, their ability to spread lessons learned, to propagate tactics, techniques, and procedure from one battlefield to another, something that coalition troops have discovered with, you know, with, with attack, with ambush tactics being developed in Iraq and being exported very rapidly to Afghanistan. This is really a race to learn. And in, in modern times, the insurgents are often much more capable of learning than the counterinsurgents because unlike the, the counterinsurgents, the insurgents are not burdened with this bureaucracy, which dictates you have to do things by the book. They can rewrite the book as they go along. And so that makes it actually tougher for counterinsurgents than was the case in prior centuries. Um, you mentioned uh, the need to, to balance clan interest and, and, and tribal interest and to find a common candidate. That's exactly right. And too often, I think what, what we find is that when you're an outside power in one of these conflicts, uh, you can be manipulated by the various parties uh, without even realizing you're being manipulated. You may think that you're backing somebody who's, who's commonly accepted, and you may realize, no, you're actually backing one faction and alienating another faction. And so it's, it's very tough to find the right candidates, especially when, as in the case of, for example, the president of Afghanistan, which is a job that's due to come open next year, uh, you can't have multiple candidates representing every single constituency in the country. You have to have one person who can be somehow minimally acceptable to everybody, and at the same time, one hopes not be excessively uh, corrupt or beholden to various warlords. That's, that's a huge, huge challenge to, to find who is, who is that person. But I mean, that's another, I mean, I didn't mention this before when I talked about the future of Afghanistan, but in addition to you know, the kind of force levels that US and NATO forces will keep in Afghanistan, a huge determinant of the future success or failure of Afghanistan is going to be who is going to be their future leader. Uh, if they can find somebody like a, like a, a, a Ramon Maisai Say in the Philippines or, or an Uribe in, in Colombia who have been tremendously successful uh, counterinsurgency leaders, Afghanistan may have a bright future. But unfortunately, if they can't do better than Hamid Karzai in the future, then the future of Afghanistan may not be so bright. Um, and you mentioned, you know, word of mouth. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to be aware of certainly in, in traditional tribal societies that uh, people may not get their information from the mass media. They may not have electricity. They may not have access to radio or television. So you certainly have to be aware of of how to transmit information in that kind of society. It makes it all the more difficult because, of course, we all come out of media-saturated cultures, so it's very hard to figure out how to deal with a very different and much more primitive kind of society. Thank you, Max. I think we have a question in the center. Steven Sequeira with the uh, Secretariat. It's interesting hearing your thoughts, uh, especially in conjunction with uh, Fred Kaplan's book on Petraeus. And you, you make the, the very valid point that it's about security and legitimacy, and these things take time and money. Uh, it seems that with Petraeus's departure and the future of, CO, of COIN almost on the wane in the US Army, investment in the Army is going to be uh, going lower and lower. And wh who is going to be left holding the bag? You have a very UN crowd here. Our budget, uh, including the budget that uh, funds our missions and our small missions in Iraq and Afghanistan was just cut a hundred million dollars for the next biennium. So, is there anything that you see in the policy gen agenda in Washington or, or from your own book tour that m is is providing an answer to who will be holding this bag and who will be funding some of these things? And, and what what's your take on that? Well, I think the honest answer is we might just drop the bag and suffer the consequences. Uh, because you're right, obviously the UN has a, 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 a real and, and important role to play here because, for example, in the case of Mali, uh, you know, the French have done a fine job in the clear phase of clear, hold, and build operations. But as we've seen repeatedly in, in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, whatever you accomplish in the clear phase can evaporate very quickly if you don't have follow-on forces that can consolidate those gains and establish lasting security. If you don't do the, the hold phase, the clear phase is not going to mean much. And so the French clearly, like the, like the Americans in Iraq, don't want to be doing the hold phase. They just want to do the clear operation and leave. Uh, 
But if they do that, obviously somebody has to come in behind them, and they're hoping now that there will be a UN-mandated force of, of, uh, of West African peacekeepers that will conduct those operations. But that's a very tough job to, to carry out. I mean, it requires troops who are well-trained, equipped, supplied, and obviously the local states don't have the resources or the training to do that. That's going to require a substantial outside commitment. I hope that France and other countries will provide those kinds of resources. If they don't, then a lot of the operations they've just conducted, I think, will basically be for naught. But you know, this is inevitably going to be a question going forward as, as the U.S. Uh, defense budget in particular shrinks, as with the likelihood that sequestration will occur in, in March. Uh, the military is, our military is really just fighting to hold on to its, its core capacity. And there are a lot of people within our armed forces who want to turn away from unconventional conflict. They want to focus on the pivot to the Pacific. They want to focus on planning for war against conventional adversaries. That's kind of the default position of any conventional military force. They want to prepare to fight other conventional military forces. But unfortunately, if you look around the world today, there are probably not going to be that many people as obliging as Saddam Hussein who are going to stick a tank army in the middle of the desert with a big hit me sign on it and, and fight in precisely the way that, that the American military would prefer. I think there's much greater likelihood that we will see more of these irregular tactics because they have proven far more effective in the future. And so I think it's imperative for the U.S. Armed Forces not to lose the, co the competence in this kind of warfare that they've uh, built up over the course of the last decade, but I'm afraid that they will. Do we have other questions on the, on the left? Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you. Colonel Sergei Yakushev, PhD, Military History, Russia. Uh, from my point of view, we are witnessing now the, a phenomenon when the, uh, if it would take away the, the, the name terrorists, insurgents, or guerrilla, guerrilla uh, movement. It's making more and more professional. I mean, uh, the guys who are fighting in, uh, in Afghanistan, some of them are fighting in, uh, were fighting in Libya, then in Syria, then in Mali. Some of them can be found again. They move again to Afghanistan, and uh, the, it becomes more and more, not national, but more and more international. And thus, we, we probably need uh, some uh, specific international uh, tools to uh, maybe even from 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 the United Nations or from uh, the, the 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 international community to somehow uh, differently view the, the, this phenomenon because uh, they uh, they're well organized as my uh, Moldova friend uh, said and. Uh, uh, especially taking into consideration the, the modern means of communications, etc. If you, if, if, you, if you can comment on this. Thank you. Well, you're absolutely right, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon, the internationalization of insurgency, because throughout most of history, insurgency has typically been localized and professionalization, and professionalization of insurgency, because throughout history, insurgency has typically been localized in, in one small area. Uh, and has not spread around. The first wave of international terrorism was the anarchists in the late 19th century, although by definition the anarchists did not have great organization. They didn't really believe in, in organization. Uh, you had another wave of international terrorism in the 1970s with some of these leftist and Arab nationalist groups who were given some degree of coordination by the Stasi, the KGB, and other Eastern European security services. But I would say now uh, the Islamists have taken this to a whole nother level, uh, where, as you're, you're absolutely right, they've set up these, in any kind of territory they control, they set up training camps, as they did in Afghanistan before, as they did most recently in Mali, just in the few months that they controlled northern Mali, and, and fighters will flock in from all different countries to get trained and then be sent out once again to, to export the revolution. And so they have some very tactically proficient fighters who can uh, deploy to various countries and serve as a, as, as a leadership cadre for, for various insurgencies. You're right, this is a, a new development, the way that they use you know, satellite television, the way they use the internet to move a lot of the kind of organizing, propaganda, fundraising, a lot of these uh, 
uh, functions that once had to be performed on a physical piece of ground can now move into cyberspace. And of course, using the, the International Transportation Network, they can get around very easily from country to country. This is a, a uh, quite literally an unprecedented challenge. And it is one, as you say, that requires an unprecedented degree of international cooperation uh, to come to grips with. But of course, as we know, often various national interests will get in the way of, of that kind of transnational cooperation. So it's very hard to, to formulate a unified response, although I think it's been, you know, it's gone the furthest in terms of police work and intelligence sharing. Uh, but beyond that, it's as we've seen in, in cases like, uh, you know, Mali, for example, it's very hard to, to mobilize a coalition to actually do something, even when these insurgents uh, grab, grab uh, control of a sizable piece of terrain. Thank you, Max. I think we are uh, coming to a close. I would like to thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Max has agreed to uh, sign uh, books for those who uh, want to continue this uh, conversation. I can, we've learned a lot today, but we can learn even more by reading uh, Max Boot, which is really a captivating one. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking Max. Thank you so much.